Well, I want to welcome everyone once again to uh, our worship experience this morning. This is obviously a very unique and unusual morning for us here at Mount Pleasant, but we're going to uh, take time like we always do to study uh, the scriptures today. And so I'm going to invite you wherever you are in the Greenwood community here, or as I mentioned earlier, we welcome all of our folks from our impact sites, impact Old Southside, Impact Fairfax, Impact Bethany, wherever you are, I'm going to invite you to take a Bible and go with me to the Gospel of Matthew, and when you get there, find the 27th chapter. And we're going to continue this journey through the Gospel of Matthew called Let's Talk About Jesus with a new message called The Characters of the Cross. And the unusual thing about this message is it's actually a two-part message although I will not be sharing part two next week. Next week, we're actually going to talk about the crucifixion, and in the following week, I'm going to come back, and I'm going to talk to you about part two of the characters of the cross, and that will make more sense to you when we get down to it. But we're going to begin this morning with part one, the characters of the cross. Back in 1972, a man named William Barrett wrote a novel called The Shape of Illusion that told the story of a Renaissance painting depicting an event from the last hours of Jesus' life. The scene in the painting was Jesus being led away to the cross. He's just been beaten, and so he's covered with blood. He's struggling to walk as he's being led by a Roman soldier through the streets of Jerusalem, and all around him there's an angry crowd. You can see hatred in the distorted faces of the people. Many of them are yelling, crucify him. Some are spitting on him. Some are mocking him. Others literally are holding stones in their hands above their heads, prepared to throw them at him when he passes by. It's an ugly scene. But here's what I want you to understand this morning. It's not a scene that's made up. There's nothing fictional about that. It's a scene that comes right out of the 27th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew where our Bibles are open this morning. Here's the really unusual thing, though, about Barrett's novel. The painting he writes about has a mysterious quality to it. Some 300 years after it was painted by an obscure German artist, those who look at it are able to see a perfect likeness of themselves in one of the characters of the painting. Some see themselves as the brutal Roman soldier, some see themselves among the crowd, the angry mob. Some see themselves in the arrogant religious leaders who orchestrated this injustice. But regardless of where they find themselves in the painting, everyone who looks at it and sees themselves is horrified. They're horrified by what they see. The main character in the novel is an agnostic man who becomes so captivated by the painting that he begins a quest to discover more about the artist, and in the end, it becomes for him a quest of faith. And while the book is nothing more than a work of fiction, it has a powerful message because there's a sense in which all of us, if we're honest, can see ourselves in the different characters of the cross. Because while we might not think we have any direct connection to the cross, the truth is we do because it was our sin. It was my sin that sent Jesus to the cross. We're all members, at least on some level, in the production of Matthew chapter 27. And so what I want to do beginning this morning and over the course of two messages is look at some of the specific characters that surrounded the cross and see what we can learn from them. If you've got your Bibles open to Matthew chapter 27, I'm going to read. It's a kind of a lengthy passage. I apologize for that, but I'm going to read verses 1 through 26, and I want you to follow along. Early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of all the people came to the decision to put Jesus to death. They bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse rather, and returned the 30 silver coins to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us, they replied. That's your responsibility. And the chief priest picked up the coins and said, it is against the law to put this into the treasury since it is blood money. So they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. That is why it has been called the field of blood to this day. And then what was spoken by Jeremiah, the prophet, was fulfilled. They took the 30 silver coins, the price set on him by the people of Israel, and used them to buy the potter's field as the Lord commanded me. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, 
And the governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge to the great amazement of the governor. Now it was the governor's custom at the feast to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who was called Christ? For he knew it was out of envy that they handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him a message. Don't have anything to do with this innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you, asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called Christ, Pilate said. They all answered, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed, asked Pilate. But they all shouted all the louder, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. And all the people answered, let his blood be on us and our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. If you're someone who likes to take notes, then I would encourage you somewhere to write down the first character of the cross, and that's Judas Iscariot. Iscariot. What Judas did was unconscionable. Over the years, different Bible scholars have tried to speculate about his motives. Some say he betrayed Jesus to try to force his hand as the Messiah. Even after all the time Judas and the other disciples had spent with Jesus, even after all he had taught them, they, like the rest of the Jews, thought the Messiah was going to come and set up a political kingdom that would deliver them from the, the authority of the Romans. In other words, they thought the Messiah would come in power. And for them, if Jesus was the Messiah, he was moving too slow. And so orchestrating his arrest would force him to take action. The same Bible scholars who believe that say that that explains why Judas was so broken and so shattered and filled with remorse when the plan didn't work out. Another possible motive that's been offered up over the years is that Judas was disillusioned. He had given about three years of his life to follow Jesus, and up to this point, it looked like it was a waste of time. So in an effort to try to recoup something from his years of following Jesus, he took the money and betrayed Jesus. We saw in verse 7 of our text that 30 pieces of silver was enough to purchase a piece of property. And so there was some value in that. Others simply say that Judas was motivated by nothing more than old-fashioned greed. Well, the truth is no one knows for sure what Judas's motives were because we don't read about his motives in the text. We just read about his actions. And his actions with regard to Jesus were shameful but there is one thing that we do know for sure about Judas, and that was on the morning of the day that Jesus was crucified, he was overwhelmed with remorse. We look back at Matthew chapter 27 and verses 3 through 5 say, say, when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 silver coins to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us, they replied. That's your responsibility. I want to make sure that we're clear about this remorse that Judas felt because he felt this remorse simply because he began to experience the excruciating pain that is the result of profound guilt. That's where the remorse came from. And why wouldn't he? I said a moment ago that what he did was unconscionable. Listen to what John MacArthur writes about Judas in his commentary on Matthew. He writes and says, No man could ever be more evil than Judas Iscariot. 
Only 11 other men in all history have had the intimate personal relationship he had with the incarnate Son of God. No man had ever been more exposed to God's perfect truth, both in precept and example. No man has been more exposed firsthand to God's love, compassion, power, kindness, forgiveness, and grace. No man has had more evidence of Jesus' divinity or more firsthand knowledge of the way of salvation. Yet in all of those three indescribably blessed years with Jesus, Judas did not take so much as the first step of faith. And friends, that's where the remorse comes from. At the end of the day, that was Judas's problem. Somehow, he had persistently rejected not just God's truth and not just God's grace, but he had rejected God's son. And not only that, he managed to conceal it from everyone. Listen to these words from Luke chapter 22, a similar account to what happened just before what we're reading about in Matthew chapter 27, and the setting is the Last Supper. I'm going to begin reading in verse 20, and it says, in the same way after the supper, he took the cup saying, that would be Jesus. He took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Verse 21 says this, but the hand, Jesus went on to say, but the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays me. They began to question among themselves which of them it might be and who would do this. And so while Jesus was at the table with the disciples for the Last Supper, and he said, the one who's going to betray me is right here. It's one of you. The next thing that Luke records is that the disciples began to argue among themselves as to which one of them it might be. Judas was so good at concealing the darkness of his heart that not even the other disciples recognized that it was him who would ultimately betray Jesus. That shouldn't surprise us because the gospels tell us, again, back in Luke 22, this time in verse 3, that at some point in that evening, Satan literally entered into the heart of Judas. But here's what I want you to understand. In spite of the darkness, in spite of the satanic influence that were controlling Judas's life in this moment, he still couldn't escape the reality of his guilt. And so Matthew 27, 3 tells us again that he was filled with remorse when he realized what he had done to Jesus. But again, just to be clear, especially to those of you who might be reading from the King James Bible this morning, we need to understand that the remorse that Judas felt was not repentance. It was just guilt. I say especially to those of you with the King James Bible because this is the way the King James Bible renders uh, this verse, this passage. It says, Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I don't want you to misunderstand the use of that word repented there because there was no repentance in the heart of Judas on this morning, only remorse and only guilt. The word for remorse in the New Testament is the Greek word metamelamai, which literally just means sorrow and regret. The word for repent, the word for repentance is the Greek word metanaeo, which literally means a change of mind. And the implication is it's a change of mind which leads to a change of action, a change of life, a change of direction. The emotion that Judas felt was not repentance. It was just regret and remorse and sorrow and guilt. But at the end of the day, it didn't cause him to turn to God. In fact, when Judas felt this guilt, Not only did he not turn to God, he turned further away from God because instead of running to God for mercy, he ran further away from God ultimately by giving up on himself and giving up on God. In spite of everything that he had seen in the ministry of Jesus about the redemption of people whose lives were broken, Judas gave up on himself, gave up on God, and took his own life. He tried to return the money hoping that would relieve the guilt, but that didn't work, and so in the end, he just hung himself. Well, there are two quick lessons that I want us to learn from Judas as the first character of the cross, and then we'll move on. The first one is this, and I'm sure it's obvious to all of us, sin never brings the satisfaction that it promises. Never. I don't 
care what sin you're talking about, what temptation you give into. Sin never, ever brings the satisfaction that it promises. Regardless of why Judas betrayed Jesus, it didn't bring the results into his life that he expected or hoped for. Instead of happiness, it brought sorrow. Instead of pleasure, it brought pain. And in the end, he gave up on himself. He gave up on God and he just killed himself. That's an important truth to remember when you are face to face with the temptation to disobey God or to enter into some act of sin. The second lesson that we can learn from Judas's life is this, don't ever give up on God, ever. Even if you're tempted to give up on yourself, and let's be honest, friends, that's where a lot of us live sometimes, especially when we make poor choices or when life for us spirals out of control or we're just victimized by the reality of life. It's easy to look at ourselves and give up on ourselves, but don't ever give up on God, never, ever. And the reason why is simple, because God never gives up on you. God will never, ever give up on you. I know that the subject of suicide is a painful and emotional subject for a lot of people, and it seems like we go through waves here in our culture where there will be a lot of suicides among well-known or famous people, and oftentimes even in our own communities and it's heartbreaking and it creates a lot of questions over the last almost 40 years of being in full-time ministry I have been involved with a lot of families where a suicide has taken place and I can tell you I don't have time to talk about it in detail but I can tell you that in pretty much every single case it was because somebody gave up on themselves and then ended up giving up on God but that's not God's plan for you or anyone. Don't ever give up on God because God never gives up on you. If you'd like to take notes, I want you to write down next to number two, just the words, the crowd. And we'll spend just a brief time here. The general belief is that this is the same crowd who just days before had taken their cloaks and palm branches and, 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 and spread them across the streets of Jerusalem as Jesus entered into the city shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Many of these people were the same people who had heard his teaching. They had seen his miracles. And yet on this day, they turned against Jesus simply because they allowed themselves to be manipulated by the hateful, evil, and self-serving men who wanted to see him dead. I look back in my Bible at verses 15 through 18 in Matthew 27. Now it was the governor's custom as at the feast to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked, him, asked them, which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Christ? For he knew it was out of envy that they had handed Jesus over to him. I skip down to verse 20. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you, asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called the Christ, Pilate answered. They all answered, or excuse me, Pilate asked. They all answered, crucify him. In verse 23, Pilate says, why? What crime has he committed? But they all shouted all the louder, crucify him. Here's what's happening. Simply stated, the Romans as an act of diplomacy and as a way to kind of diffuse the tension and the bitterness that was in Israel when they began to rule had begun a custom that allowed for the release of any one prisoner during the Passover celebration. And because they had this, my Bible says, notorious prisoner named Barabbas, Pilate when he couldn't find any reason to hold or punish Jesus, offered Barabbas up for, uh, for release because he believed that the people who up to this point were known for admiring Jesus, Pilate believed that they would demand for Jesus' release. But that's not what happened. And we saw why in verse 20, because the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. But Pilate, not knowing what the leaders had done, continued to address the, uh, the crowd, but they were so effective in turning the crowd that Pilate only had to give up. And in verse 24, he said, I am innocent of this man's blood. And the crowd, this is an, 
amazing to me. The crowd in verse 25 said, let his blood be on us and our children. One quick lesson, and I'll make it as simple and direct as possible. Think for yourself. When it comes to life, we all have a responsibility to think for ourselves. And while that's great advice in any and every circumstance, it's especially good advice when it comes to matters of faith. You can't let your beliefs and your convictions related to truth or morality or relationships or any other thing you can think of be shaped by anything other than what God has revealed to us in his word, in the Bible. And the sad truth is we have churches today who are filled by people who live by some kind of a progressive or revisionist version of Christianity that's not even remotely connected to what the Bible says. When it comes to the most important matters of life, <clears throat> we have to trust the Bible and we have to think for ourselves <clears throat> because <clears throat> it's what God says that matters. It's not what our friends say or our relatives say. It's not what a college professor says. We have to think for ourselves. We can't go by what we hear on the media. We can't be swayed by what celebrities think about issues in life and living, especially moral issues. You can't pay attention to the media. You could go on and on and on. We can't fall into the mentality of this crowd, even if it means we have to stand alone with our beliefs and our convictions. I'm not saying that it's not important to seek advice. The Bible encourages us to seek advice. I think of passages like these two. Proverbs 11 and 14 says, For lack of guidance, a nation falls, but many advisors make victory sure. Proverbs 12, 15 says, The way of a fool seems right to him, but a wise man listens to advice. But at the end of the day, here's the lesson we learned from this angry crowd that cried for the death of Jesus you can't be manipulated by someone else. You have to think for yourself. Let me give you a third thing to write down with regard to the characters of the cross. Write down the name Pontius Pilate. Pilate's story is told in the latter part of our text that we read earlier in verses 11 through 26 of Matthew chapter 27. Pilate was the procurator of the province of Judea. In other words, he was like the governor and from the beginning, Pilate was at odds with the Jewish religious leaders because of an ongoing power struggle. One example would be at one point, Pilate built an expensive aqueduct in Jerusalem and illegally took money from the Jewish temple treasury to pay for it. When people protested his misuse of funds, Pilate's response was to have them killed, to have them executed because he was a cruel man. And that's what he was known to do. He was known to murder his enemies on a whim. When I was researching this message, I read that according to history books, by the time Pilate faced Jesus, he was in hot water with Rome. The emperor was tired of Pilate's inability to control the Jewish, Jewish masses. And so as a result, Pilate was at this point in his life at risk of losing his job and maybe even at risk of losing his life because of all the crimes that he had committed. So when these religious leaders brought Jesus to him, he was desperate. He was desperate to earn their favor, and as a result, he basically let them railroad Jesus to an unfair and an unjust death because he thought that would appease the religious leaders and make them less of a threat to him. At the same time, Pilate tried to distance himself from everything that happened. And so when he saw that the crowd had turned against Jesus and decided that they wanted Barabbas to be released and Jesus to be executed, then Pilate just stood by and let the events unfold for themselves. And to ensure that he wasn't blamed for Jesus' death, he made a public show of his innocence, literally washing his hands in front of the people and saying, it is your responsibility, not mine. And so here's the bottom line. Pilate could have acquitted Jesus, but he didn't. Instead, out of nothing more than self-preservation, that's all it was, he gave in to the pressure of those around him and basically just turned his back on his position and his authority and everything that was happening. He simply said, whatever happens, it's not my fault. Even when his wife intervened in verse 19 saying, don't do anything with this man. I've had terrible, I've had a terrible experience today in my dreams related to him because he's an innocent man. Even when she tried to speak up, he still took the path of least resistance. 
And when I think about Pilate, here's the one thing that stands out to me. When it came to the death of Jesus, his words were, again, it's not my fault. And so the lesson to learn from Pilate is this. Take responsibility for your actions. Take responsibility for your life. Maybe you're like me and you're getting tired of hearing those words over and over again in the culture that we live in today. It's not my fault. It's unbelievable the kind of things that people try to justify today simply by saying, it's not my fault. It's nothing new. Here's Pilate with the opportunity to do the right thing, and instead he washes his hands of the matter and says, again, whatever happens, it's not my fault. But we need to take responsibility for our actions because you can't wash your hands of every difficult circumstance that comes along. There are some responsibilities in life that none of us can escape. I'm a firm believer in the grace of God. I know that I'd be helpless and hopeless without it, but I'm also a firm believer that God has given all of us responsibilities that we can't shift to anyone else. So if no one has ever said this to you before, I'm going to say it to you this morning, and I want to be really clear. You are responsible for you. No one else. You are responsible for you. You are responsible for the kind of life of faith that you have. You're responsible for the kind of Christian you become. You're responsible for the kind of husband or the wife you become. You're responsible for the kind of parent you become. You're responsible for how you manage whatever it is God has entrusted to you in this life. You're responsible for your own soul. You're responsible for your own spiritual life. You can't look to anyone else. It's yours and yours alone. You're responsible Pilate was so afraid of losing his job because of ongoing conflict with the religious leaders and because of his ongoing bad behavior that he basically abandoned his responsibility as the governor of Judah and his tagline for his life was, it's not my fault. How pathetic is that at the end of the day? How pathetic is that? Well, let me tell you what all three of these characters of the cross have in common. I'm talking about Judas Iscariot and the crowd and Pontius Pilate. I can say it in a single word, culpability. In other words, they were all guilty. They were all responsible in some way for the death of Jesus. Judas ran from his responsibility by giving up on himself and giving up on God and ultimately just giving up in despair. The crowd ran from their responsibility by refusing <clears throat> to think for themselves and stand on their own convictions and their own belief and their own experience and allowed themselves to be manipulated by evil men. Pilate ran from his responsibility by, again, just washing his hands and saying, whatever happens, it's not my fault. Every one of them was guilty. And that's the practical lesson we learn from all of their lives. But beyond that, Here's what we need to remember, because this is an ugly, disappointing time in Jesus' life, and so here's what we need to remember. Regardless of all of these other things, God was still in control. He was in complete control of everything that was happening. And there was never a point in this unfolding drama that we're looking at where Jesus was a victim. All of it played out according to God's divine plan. And so, I got two thoughts as we close. First, if you, as you listen to this message today, feel the conviction of God in your heart, in your life, especially as you look at Judas and you look at the crowd and you look at Pilate, if somehow you see the reality of your life in their lives because you've either given up on God or because you've stopped thinking for yourself and you've allowed yourself to be manipulated by someone else or because you've decided that your default mode as you go through life is, it's not my fault, then you can change that this morning. It's just a matter of opening up your heart to God. It's a matter of surrendering to God. It's a matter of confessing, acknowledging, and then confessing the reality of whatever sin it is that's caused you to find yourself in that position. I love the words of 1 John 1, 9, where John writes and says, if we confess our sin, he, talking about God, is faithful and just and will forgive us our sin and purify us from all unrighteousness. And maybe that's what you need to do this morning. 
at some point at the conclusion of this message is you just need to, to take a, a, a good long look back into Matthew 27, point out where you see yourself and then ask God for his forgiveness and his help and to begin a new way of living. The second thing I want to mention <clears throat> And this is going to seem a re- like a really odd way to end the message, but I, as I was writing this message, I couldn't help but think about the fact that the one question that I have been asked dozens and dozens of times over the years related to Judas is this. Did Judas even have a choice in the matter of his betrayal of Jesus? I mean, some people who are even critics of the Bible will point that and talk about how unjust God really is. <clears throat> Why? Judas, why, why him? He, he had no opportunity for any other outcome. Let me give you the very best answer I can give you in this brief amount of time that I have left. When you study the Bible, it's clear from the <clears throat> final days of Jesus' life on earth that those events, all the events in those final days were foreordained to include the betrayal of Judas. Judas just as surely as the cross was foreordained, just as surely as the resurrection was foreordained. And I don't believe Judas had any choice in the matter, honestly. Luke 22.3, I I made a reference to this earlier. We didn't put the verse up on the screen, but Luke 22.3 says literally that Satan entered Judas, and the moment that happened, the die was cast for Judas. But having said that, I want you to listen to me really close. I also believe that once Judas completed that unconscionable, shameful, ungodly mission of betraying Jesus, he was free to make things right with Jesus because Jesus died on the cross for Judas just like he died on the cross for you and for me. And Judas could have fallen on his knees in repentance, not just in sorrow and regret and guilt, But in repentance, the way I talked about it earlier, metanaeo, in a change of mind, which would lead to a change of direction and a change of life. He could have fallen on his knees in repentance and asked Jesus for forgiveness. Now, I'll be the first to say that he would have needed some serious spiritual warfare to get Satan out of his life. But the Bible says, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the the world. Jesus, Satan is no match for Jesus at the end of the day. But that's not what Judas chose. And we saw in our text that he felt remorse, but again, it wasn't repentance. And as a result, he gave up on himself, and then he gave up on God, and then he took his life. And so I'm going to close the message this morning by just reiterating something that I said earlier. And I want to say, I want everyone who's listening to understand that I'm saying this directly to you, just like it's you and me in the room. No matter who you are, or where you've been, or what you've done, no matter what you're struggling with in this moment, no matter what you're afraid of, no matter what seems out of control, don't ever give up on God because God will never give up on you. I want you to pray with me this morning. Father in heaven, thank you for a chance to open up the Bible today and share a lesson from your word from Matthew chapter 27, which is a brutal passage of scripture because we see what happens to Jesus. The beginning of the end, at least from the earthly perspective. We know as people of faith, that it wasn't the end, but it certainly was a dark moment. And remind us today of our need to take responsibility for our lives, of our need to make our own decisions and think for ourselves. Remind us today that no matter what, we should never give up on you because you never give up on us. We love you and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.